Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. When we do exceptional things is when we get out of the safety zone. It's when we get into the space where we have no idea what the heck we're going to do and we figure out how to move forward in that. back. This is the Pencil Kings podcast, and today we are talking with the one and only John Shindetti. I'm really excited to talk with John because in a recent coaching call, Shane, who some of you may know, has been on the podcast a few times, had interviewed me. Uh, he was talking about how John had inspired him, and so I even got some questions coming in from Shane. So to start off, John, why don't you give people a one or two minute overview of some of the things you've worked on? You've worked on a lot, but... Um, yeah, just to get people uh, a sense of who we're talking with today. Okay, a one or two minute. I'll, I'll try and trim it down. So um, currently, I, I'm the creative director for ThinkGeek.com um, here in the Denver office. I also own and run um, Art Order, which is a combination um, artist career development uh, company. And then also we help artists. Uh, create their products and create IPs that we can then help them get manufactured, printed, proved, out into the world, distributed, all that fun stuff. Um, where most po- people know me from in my, in my past is when I was a creative director for Dungeons & Dragons, which I did for many, many years. Uh, started on back in the days of second edition and ran all the way up until the launch of fifth edition. Aside from that, I've worked in lots of different venues, lots of different companies. Um, I, some of my I've included everybody from Microsoft to, to Harley Davidson to Yo Play Yogurt of all places um, and lots of other folks. So that's a quick short rundown of me. Um, as far as my personal time, I like to spend a lot of time mentoring and educating um, artists and helping them grow their careers and spend a lot of time doing lectures and talks and workshops on that kind of stuff. And so just to start off, has Denver always been home for you, or is that like a strategic location that that's where Think Geek is, so you moved to go to Denver? I, I actually moved here. I was in uh, for probably about 16 years prior to that. I was in, in the Seattle area there working on at uh, Wizards of the Coast on Dungeons & Dragons. Um, about three years ago, I moved out here to work with the Think Geek office here in Denver. Um, at the time, we were a little company called, a little startup company called Treehouse Brand Stores, and then we got acquired by Think Geek, and then we got acquired by GameStop. And I keep crossing my fingers that we don't get acquired anytime soon because I just bought new cards. <laughs> oh, I love it. And Denver's a, the, a great place. I visited a couple times. I have a favorite uh, bar there called One Up, where they have oh. all the retro arcade machines and whatnot. If you're ever in the Denver area, definitely do go check it out. It's very cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I'm. Actually, you know, to start off, I'd like to, because you've had so much experience mentoring artists, I'd like to start off with these questions from Shane, and then we can really dive into art order, because I'm curious about how this can help some of the things that we're doing with Pencil Kings, but I know that there's a lot of other creatives that want to get products created, and they just have no idea how to do it, and there's a lot that goes into it, and um, I want to start to give people some clarity on that in, in the limited time that we have. So I'm going to hit you with these. So the first question is, you've mentored a huge number of artists, helped build and guide an art community for years, and opened many eyes to the inner workings of the creative business, showing them that there is much more to being an artist than just creating. What one piece of advice could you give to new artists to help them cut through the noise and differentiate themselves? Wow, you don't you don't pull me punches. That's the toughest question to start out with. Um, that's a great question. Um, I guess the first thing I'd probably tell everybody is to stop worrying about how to make themselves fit into the industry and start thinking instead about what they're really passionate about. Uh, too many of the students and young artists that I work with come to me and they show me their portfolio and say, here's my portfolio, this is the stuff I like doing, where can I go get work? And that's kind of a backwards way of looking at it. You know, they're trying to shoehorn themselves into places that they think they fit versus looking at what they're excited about, what they're passionate about, um, what really gets them stoked in the morning, and then figuring out how to grow a career from that. Uh, One of my favorite stories I love to relate, and anybody who's listened to me before has heard this story before, but one of the artists I was working with and helping to do some mentoring, we were doing portfolio reviews, 
and uh, Christopher Burdett is his name. And he kept showing his, his book to me. It was never getting, he wasn't, he was really struggling. He wasn't getting a lot much, he wasn't getting much better. And I kind of got frustrated. Well, actually, he was the one who was really frustrated. I was just frustrated in trying to help him. And I just asked him in the depths of our conversation, I said, what is it you love drawing? And he goes, I love drawing creatures, tons and tons of creatures. Well, at the time, he had almost nothing of creatures in his book. And I went, said, go back, do four or five pieces, come back to me. Show me these pieces that are creature-based, the stuff that you love, the stuff that you do. Um, and he did that. And the upside to that was that I instantly gave him work uh, doing stuff with D&D &D at the time. And he has pretty much taken his entire career down the path of doing great creatures um, and does quite a bit of wonderful work in that. And so for me, really getting a sense of who the artist is and what they're excited and passionate about is much more valuable than having people coming down and saying, hey, I heard that concepting is going to be the next great thing to get into. Maybe I want to get into that. Or, hey, Viz Dev is supposed to be the next hot thing. I should try and get into that. And instead of thinking about those types of things, thinking instead of where can they be the most successful for themselves, you know, because like for Chris, when he took that on, he instantly created a whole lot of buzz for himself. He created broke out of the noise of the 8 million other people out there because he was like, I'm going to do creatures and this is the look I'm going to do and this is the style I'm going to do and he just ran out there and hit it. And I think stepping back and figuring that out for yourself is probably the first place to start. Awesome. I love it. And uh, I, I've seen it so many times where people are trying to, they feel like well, for our community, they need to master all the fundamentals before they can start to approach somebody. But if you love doing creatures, it, there's nothing to say that you need to be a master of drawing spaceships. No. You know, it just, it just doesn't make any sense. Although that's what people, I've seen so many people doing this, thinking that they need to master everything but before they can do it. And it, it's just, uh, it drives me a little bit bad. Yeah, I, I see it a lot too. A lot of the students that I've had in my, because I also, oh, I forgot to mention that earlier. I also teach at Bethany Applied Arts. And they, a lot of my students will come to me and say, hey, I saw so-and-so at this event the other day, and they told me that my book is missing environments. And I think I need to work on environments for my portfolio class this semester. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's great. Do you like doing environments? Well, no, I hate it. Well, why would you want to put something in your book that you hate doing? Well, because they, they said I should. I'm like, don't do things because people say you should. Do it because, because it makes sense for your career. Yep. Okay, next hard-hitting question from Shane. Uh, what are the three worst ways an artist has ever screwed up a job or business relationship with no names? <laughs> <laughs> the three worst ways. Uh, the first biggest one was um, disappearing off to the face of the earth, uh, where we were getting close to a deadline, and I'm emailing, and I'm making phone calls, and they're not responding to either, and I have no idea as to what's going to happen. And to be honest, you know, with art directors, they freak out in those kinds of roles because their job is dependent on hitting deadlines and their job is dependent on making sure that everything's done on time and correctly and beautifully and all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, because of what happened, I had to dive off and go try and find another illustrator to put together, you know, this new product for me in like four days and they busted their tail and did it. And Two weeks after the fact, the artist responded to me saying, hey, sorry, I fell off. Here's my stuff. And I'm like, don't need it now. I'm done. And they lost their career with me because that put me in a position that I can't do. I can't deal with. Uh, so dropping off the face of the earth is probably the worst one. Uh, the second worst one is is probably bad mouthing people in the industry. We have a really small industry uh, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. They're all small and they're all kind of incestuous and everybody knows everybody and there's nothing worse than an artist who goes off bad mouthing a product or bad mouthing an art director or bad mouthing somebody else because generally what happens is even if that's it's not the art director that hears it if you're bad mouthing somebody in a very unprofessional way I don't want to work with you and that's a really quick way to sit here and ruin a career as well and probably the third fastest way to ruin your career is to uh, miss a deadline and it kind of goes back to the first one about not falling off the earth, face of the earth. But even if you're communicating and you miss a deadline, it's the quickest way to 
end your, end your career with an art director because uh, it's got to be all about trust and all about professionalism. And if you're not meeting your deadlines, that's the quickest way to kill yourself. Awesome. I love it. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's start to talk about art order. So you, you touched on it very briefly, but uh, could you give us some examples of maybe the, the projects that you can talk about? I'm sure that there's things in development that you can talk about, just to give people a sense of what kind of things, like a tangible sense of what, you, what kind of products you're bringing to life at art order. So, sure. Um, and it could be as simple, the, the range is really broad. Because in truth, what I'm working with with, is, with artists is trying to find things that are outside of the ordinary. Um, probably 70% of the projects that I get that people come to me to, to help develop is, hey, I want to do an art book. And uh, matter of fact, I'm busy in the middle of writing a blog post about that whole idea too. Um, so check back in a week or so with Art Order. You'll see more about that. But um, the so the bulk of it is just printed goods. You know, folks will say, I want to do this, or I want to, you know, I want to do an art book, or I, I want to do a sketchbook, or I want, you know, and those are all fine and dandy, but um, there's a lot of inherent problems in that. That's a, it's a market that's really flooded. It's really niche. It's, it's tough to make a lot of money in it. Though it's not impossible, we helped uh, John, John Batiste Mong do his art book uh, recently, and he did a, he kickstarted it and did very, very well raised, I think, like $165,000, something like that. So not sneezing at it. The flip side to that is what I want to try and do is help people create revenue streams, places where they can make money that is ongoing versus a one-off product that is out there and is gone. Um, so probably about not quite a year ago, we worked with uh, a good game designer and an artist to help them create a line of goodies. We called it, well, they, they called Stuff Scarves and which were probably one of my favorite projects to date so far, which is they were plushies that had scarves that are inside that, them to act as a stuffing. And then you pull the scarf out and you, and you lay it around your neck and wear it as a scarf. Uh, for folks who've seen them, uh, one of them is a, uh, a little zombie. You pull his brain out and then they've got the connected gory guts that actually are the scarf in between. The other one is a cute little... Uh, unicorn that uh, poops cute little rainbows and we've got a number of other ones that were in the works for in the upcoming year but uh, we've done everything from so we've done everything from art books to apparel to stuffed scarves to uh, tabletop games we've got two or three tabletop games that are in production right now um, one by incarnate games which is actually out on Kickstarter uh, trying to get their funding right now and uh, we've worked with uh, Clark, uh, whose last name suddenly is escaping me. You know, I hate me for that, but Clark, uh, he designed the Reckless Deck uh, concepting tool, and we helped him with that. Uh, we recently did a Kickstarter, which didn't fund, un unfortunately, but we're going to be relaunching in February. We're going back, retooling the whole offering all over again based on a lot of feedback we got, and we're going to come back and hit that in February. And so it's... It's all over the place. We do a lot of different things. Again, the idea that I work with is I try and work with people to help create products that are more than just a simple little product. Uh, I spent some time at uh, SCAD, which is the uh, Savannah College of Art and Design down in Atlanta a couple, uh, I guess a couple of months ago now. And I'm working with a number of students there who had some brilliant ideas and we're trying to work together to come up with some really cool products out of that uh, that, again, fall way outside of the standard realm that we see with most artists coming out with just art books and stuff. And these are actual products that we're hoping to develop into full-on lines and full-on IPs. So it really kind of goes all over the place. The biggest thing that I like to do is just sit down with people and say, well, what's your idea? And then we just spend a lot of time iterating and back bouncing it back and forth and try and come up with a product that is novel and owns its own niche and is breaks out of the noise, kind of like when I talk about doing with portfolios. So who would be, because I feel like if you just put that out into the universe and, hey, you've got a great product, I want to hear from you. But I feel like 
you might get flooded or maybe you're already flooded. Is there a way or a criteria that somebody could use? Uh, because I love coming up with these frameworks, even if they're on the fly and they're not perfect, that people can then think of their product in terms of this framework and say like, yes, this is something that I should bring to art order right away. Or this is something that it's close, but it needs a little bit of retooling. And then I can bring art order because there's bringing things too early and then there's bringing things too late. And there's definitely a sweet spot there. So where's the sweet spot to reach out to you guys? So that's a good question too. Um, there's not a lot of the too early. Um, in fact, often what I like to do is have conversations with people very early on um, just so we can talk about what's possible, what they might want to think about with, with the goal a lot of times is I give them a lot of homework to go and do research and figure out what they want to do and really kind of nail down what their dream is a little bit better. And so sometimes it might take them six months, a year or more to sit here and get to a spot where they're ready to come back and say, okay, now I'm ready. So the too early is not as big an issue for me. Um, for me, the too late is a bigger problem. Uh, so often I have so many people who come to me and say, hey, I'm ready to do a Kickstarter. I want to run next month. And can you give me print prices? And I'm like, I can get you print prices, but I'm pretty sure that if you're only going to, if you're just now talking to somebody around getting your Kickstarter in a month, you're going to have a hard time making it succeed because there's so much work you got to do prior to a Kickstarter launching. And so sometimes that, is something that derails a lot of people because they didn't realize the amount of work they've got to do up front before a Kickstarter even launches. They just think of that as a kind of a panacea for, hey, quick funding, <laughs> let's go. Um, so the too late is a bigger issue. For me, kind of the, the goal for I have for Kickstarter, or not for Kickstarter, for Art Order is very simple. I want you to come with an idea, a kernel of an idea. It doesn't have to be finished. It doesn't have to be polished, but it should be a kernel of an idea, and you should understand a few key things. One, what makes it unique? And if it doesn't, if it's not unique, and if it's just a variant of somebody else's, you need to figure out how to make you make it unique. Um, what makes it distinctive? What makes it stand out from the rest of the field? So if you're going to do an art book, which there's a billion out there, how do you make your art book different? How do you make it stand out? How do you make it noticed? How do you convince somebody who's got eight other offerings for art books to sit here and spend their $40 on? How do you convince them to spend $40 on yours versus everybody else's? Um, the other thing is, what's the unique selling feature of it? You know, uh, one of the biggest things you'll see out there in Kickstarter all the time nowadays is folks will say, hey, we're taking the fleece hoodie and it's not, you know, but we're not just making a fleece hoodie, we're making the best fleece hoodie. And this is why it's most important, and this is why it's the coolest, and this is why you should buy it. And really being able to come in and say, John, this is the product I want to make. And this is why it's special, and this is why it's unique, and this is who it's going to sell to, and this is what it's going to sell for. You know, and having all that information, or at least having had thought about that information, even if you don't have all the answers to it, so that when we start talking about how to make your product and how to make it really great, you know, so that I can talk to you about, you know, funding goals and funding options, printing and manufacturing. We can talk about distribution, you know, because we work with folks who are just doing Kickstarters. We work with folks who are looking to do distribution through um, specialized markets or to get into some of the mask guys, the guys we did the stuff scarf for. Um, we got, you know, and actually I had, even though it got into ThinkGeek, it really had nothing to do with me because I can't use my influence to actually get into ThinkGeek. It just happened to be that we got samples sent here to my office, my day daytime office, and I pulled them out and had them on my desk, and people came in and said, oh, my God, those are amazing. We need to get those into our store, too. So, But I work with Abrams, and I work with Diamond, and I work with a number of other distributors to get folks into other mass channels or specialty retailers, too. So having an understanding of who you want to go to, who you want to talk to, and why it's special, that's probably the biggest key things that you want to know before you can call me. Okay. Next thing for me, I, I have this mental block and I feel like a lot of people do as well. And I'll tell you what my mental block is. And, and hopefully for you listening, you can think about what your mental blocks are. I've got an idea, 
I can check the boxes that it's unique. Uh, I've done a little bit of research and I see, I, I, I know what we're going to, or what I'd like to price it for and, and how I envision it. I'm ready to go to you. But then that little lizard brain comes in and says, you can't afford this. John's going to be way too expensive. And I don't know why it is, but I have this number in my head of $30,000. No matter what I come up with, it doesn't matter what kind of product, which market, whatever, there's always this, it's going to cost you $30,000 to start this up. And while I have some money in the bank, you know, set aside for projects like this, I definitely don't have $30,000. Yeah. What do you say? What do you say to that? Because I feel like there's a lot of us, especially with artists, we have all kinds of weird money hangups and it just stops us in our tracks. And then we go back to the cubicle, which we hate. And then we just keep trudging on. Yeah. You know what? And the money conversation is probably one of the biggest conversations that I have with everybody who's ever called me. Um, and it's everything from the, A, how much do you cost? Which people are always surprised about. But then the B, how do I get you know funding for prototyping and this kind of stuff? Um, and so one of the first things I always offer is if you hop onto my website, theartorder.com, you can click on there and get so sign up for a free half hour consultation. And that's a great place for us to just kind of talk through some of those issues that people always come up and run against. So the biggest one for me is that um, I totally get what you're saying. The whole $30,000 is so easy to hit $30,000 in any kind of program um, or more. But what we often do is the, I work with a lot of different companies that I, part of the reason why I got into this business to begin with was I had an artist friend who was creating an art book, and it got published by um, a standard publisher. Great, great, the book turned out great. They were happy with it and everything. But every time a book sold, he made a dollar off of it, and I just broke my heart to see that he made a dollar off the years and years of his art that were going out there. So, what I did was I pulled together my 30 years of contacts and and folks that I know in the industry and folks that I know out in the manufacturing and printing world, and have been using that to help get these guys into factories and into printers that typically wouldn't get them. Like the guys I do use for my plushes, they typically won't touch anybody who doesn't make at least 20,000 to 30,000 units. Um, but because of my past relationship with them, they're willing to work with me at a much, much lower minimum, which really helps out in a lot of ways. And at the same time, they don't crush us with, you know, really uploaded uh, minimum costs. So, the big thing that I'm always talking with folks is, okay, let's talk about how we're going to do this, you know, and we talk through the funding options and you've got the self-funding where you're, you're paying for everything. You've got taking it out on credit cards. You got the taking out business loans, uh, Kickstarter, angels, investors. We can talk about all the different options and what's the pros and cons of each of them and what they're interested in and what they're not interested in. And then even, but more importantly, what I'm trying to do is I, I try and talk with them to figure out ways to bootstrap a lot of this stuff. One of the things that Ardor does is I'll t talk through people from point A, the beginning of the project, all the way up, you know, where you're doodling it on your napkins to the final part where you're shipping it off to your customers and talk about every step along that way. And I actually do just did a four-hour workshop on that at LuxCon a few weeks ago, um, which was very well attended. And I talked about that from point A to point B and then all the steps in between. And uh, so what we do is we spend a lot of time talking about that, figuring out what they can take on themselves, what they need me to take on, or what we need to bring in experts from outside the company into it. And then we just talk about the costs. And the costs are pretty simple. In our order, because I work with creatives, and I know that creatives are not, they're not little money bags, uh, we basically work two ways. I have, when I'm doing all the production and manufacturing stuff, we have a small uh, much lower than the standard industry rates. We have a small uh, percentage that we tack on top of it. We do transparent billing so that I'll show you exactly what the costs are coming out of the factory and then exactly what our order is charging on top of that for all the project management and the negotiations and the logistic planning and all that kind of stuff. So you'll know exactly where that's at. And then anything beyond that, beyond, so if you need, so like when we did John Batiste Mong's video, we had a flat rate to sit here and cover the costs uh, you know exactly what is it, what it was up front. Most of our costing, we try to back end, especially if you're doing Kickstarters, we try and back end our costs so that you're not charged anything until your Kickstarter funds. And then if it funds, you know, you know exactly what the costs are going to be right up front. 
because again, my goal is to help artists create the stuff. Uh, while yes, I do want to make money on this, I'm not looking to sit here and make uh, make millions and millions of dollars on this. I'm looking to create more of an opportunity for artists to create stuff and create cool, fun products than I am about just trying to create massive amounts of income for myself. I believe that if I can create ways for them to get income, I'll also get it as well. So I kind of have that sideways view of coming at things. That's so great. Especially I love the the transparency of the costs and then also being able to front load it. So you know what you need to hit in order to it just everything is very clear so that even though you might it might still have that lizard brain thirty thousand dollars or whatever your number is going through the whole process, at least you'll have numbers and somebody guiding you along the way to say like, okay, it's gonna be more than thirty or it's gonna be less, but here's how these costs break out. Here's what you need to hit, here's how we're going to hit it. Um and it's not it's not nearly as scary once you start breaking things down and putting it onto paper or, or digital or whatever format you're using. Yeah, what I mean, one of the big things I like to spend a lot of time with is you know, especially the, for the artists, I want to do this through Kickstarter, which is one of the principal ways that most of the guys that we work with do their funding is through Kickstarter. Um, you know, and everything from like the stuff scars where they weren't looking to try and make all their profit in the Kickstarter, they're using that as creating their seed money to actually do a production run that could buy enough product for them to sell at the cons and events for the next year, which became so successful. We're having, uh, we've burned through most of their stuff far be you know, far faster than we expected. But then the second thing is that we use that Kickstarter. Uh, we spent a lot of time around the Kickstarter talking about how to set up good stretch goals, how to sit here and do all the pricing. Uh, so that the thing I hate the most is I watched one of my good friends before I kicked Arthur off doing this stuff. Um, he had a very, very successful Kickstarter, so successful that he was willy-nilly making up stretch goals to try and keep people engaged and keep them excited. Um, and at the end of the project, that he, he sold a ton, I think close to you know, $130,000, $140,000 worth of, of backer. But he ended up making almost no money, um, and I think he may have actually even lost a couple thousand dollars because pricing he had he was throwing out there to set up for his stretch goals hadn't been baked in at the very beginning so he was actually hurting himself with shipping costs and incremental costs so we try and spend a lot of time making sure that people are setting up their kickstarters not just to make money but so that they make money in a smart way so that they're actually able to put money into their pockets at the end of it and say hey i actually made something instead of just making a product that just broke even or worse, lost money. Yeah, and that's a story that I've heard many times now, actually. People who, you know, you, you look at their Kickstarter page, and it's amazing. They, they made all these sales. But when you talk to them and you get this sort of behind-the-scenes story, it, it you, and they're not even counting how many hours they spent replying to emails, building this stuff, fixing things, doing all this. They're basically paying themselves nothing for their time, and then they're losing money at the end of the day. And it's just, I don't know, it's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking. Okay, my last lizard brain question. <laughs> Actually, I, I like these. I like these lizard brain questions uh, because I know that there's a lot of um, people, especially, you know, you get your break in the industry, whatever uh, creative industry you're in, and all of a sudden you can't tell anyone about your project. And it's kind of like this badge of honor, like, I, I, I'm working on something so cool, but I can't tell you because it's NDA. And, and you know, that, that does wear off after a while, I think, for most people. And we used to... Um, some people would joke, you know, you'd be at a bar and you'd clink beers and here's a friend DA and they'd tell you just enough so that you could kind of piece things together, but they wouldn't tell you exactly what it was, you know, between friends. But when, if somebody's coming to you with their idea and they're worried about like, oh, well in this 30 minute consultation, will my idea get stolen? Uh, what do you say to people like that? I, I feel like I'm past that point and I'm I'm happy to share because I know it's all about the execution. It's not about the idea. But I feel like this is something that could leave people stuck, especially if this is your first product. And I would hate for your great product to not to not be brought out to the world because you're too afraid to share it with somebody like John who could really help you with it. And and that one is really simple. First of all, I can say, well, trust me, because if I screw up and do something like that, I'm just going to do nothing but break my own business, which is nobody would trust me. But secondly, to be really blunt is if you want to share something with me and you're really concerned about 
it being shared and making sure that I'm under a blanket gag agreement, send me an NDA. I'm happy to sign an NDA saying I will not talk about your product. I won't talk about your IP. I won't talk about your business. I have no problem with that. Um, because again, it goes back to the thing of if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do the, the bad thing, which is take somebody's idea and go off and create my own product, all I'm gonna do is crucify me and my business. And that's not the place I wanna be. So what I wanna be is make it so that you're super comfortable about what's gonna happen. And if that means you send me an NDA and I sign it, we're good. I don't have any problem doing that. In fact, you know, I would encourage people to think about that stuff as they're coming up with new ideas. Make sure they're sharing it with people who are under NDA or are completely trustworthy from their standpoint so that they're not giving off their idea. I can't tell you how many times I've come up with ideas and shared it with somebody. And, and then six months later, I see my idea floating around and I'm like, well, that kind of sucked. So uh, because I've been on the flip side of that, for me, that's a, that's a no go zone. I just don't even fly in those waters because I won't, you know, if you share something with me, it does not get shared outside of my office. In fact, I don't even share it usually in my office um, until we've moved into an agreement where we're going to move forward with the project. And then I bring the rest of the team in. All right. Well, I think that's, that's it for me and my lizard brain. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you think is really important that would potentially stop somebody from contacting you or reaching out or considering art order? Because I want to make sure that we cover all our bases so that somebody listening to this, they have no more reason not to bring their project to life. I think the biggest thing that I've, I've run across the past year, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to people. And the biggest problem I've seen with most people is that they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in their dream. They don't believe in their idea. Because um, they'll, they'll say things like, if in a conversation they throw out a an idea and I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. I love that. And they're like, really? You think so? I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I just, you know, I just didn't think it was good enough to share with anybody. In the world of art order, that's part of the whole gig is that I want to meet with people and talk with them and then have them share their ideas so that we can then bounce them back and forth and iterate on them to make sure that they're the best, most successful possible idea. You know, for a while there, I played with a whole, you know, I had a whole tagline that was all based around the idea of you know, bring your dreams to life, but it sounded just really cliche and goofy, but that really was the basis for how Art Order started, which was helping artists take, you know, things that are drawn on the back of their napkins and taking them to the hands of their clients and their consumers, you know, about taking those dreams and putting them into action and creating something real and tangible from them. So I think the biggest thing that stops most people is that belief that it can actually happen, that they can make it work and that they can be successful in this. And we put those roadblocks up for ourselves all the time. And one of the biggest things I like to do with Art Order is say, let's take the roadblocks out of your life and go fulfill on your life as you want versus trying to dodge and deal with roadblocks all your life. I'm just taking a moment here to ponder that because I see this issue of confidence coming up in so not just with creating a new product, but just with artists and creatives in their own work. And it's something that when I had my own career, I, I just jumped. Like uh, we, I told my friends, I'm going to move to China and start an outsourcing studio for video games. And they all said, you're insane. <laughs> you haven't even worked in video games before. You did a little bit of work in movies. And I just did it. And I feel like that part of my brain didn't exist when it comes to creative work. Um, have you, have you seen anyone get over this? Not in terms of like, I feel like creating a product is maybe something bigger, but just sort of general advice that for the people that you've mentored or, or maybe there's a book that you've seen be really effective because I wish more people had this confidence. And in my case, it was just like, there's a part of my brain that just doesn't fire with taking risks creatively. But I know for a lot of people it's there. And I feel it myself with, with Pencil Kings, the business. I feel this fear all the time. Um, so it's it's there's different parts of your life where you're not afraid and then there's parts where you are. But have you found a way that can help people unlock? Or, or I don't know if I'm asking this the right way, but I feel like it's a really important question. I wish I had a better way to articulate it. Um, it's something that comes up in almost every conversation I ever have. 
I, I mean, it even comes up with conversations of, with myself and my coach and stuff like that is the biggest, I guess the most important thing I ever found in my entire life was the rec recognition that when I play within what I know, it's safe and I don't feel like, I don't feel afraid and I feel confident, but I'd never really move forward. It's only when I get out of that comfort zone, when it, only when I get outside the bubble, when I'm in the zones where I don't know what's going on, I don't know how to do things, I don't know the answers, that that's the space where I learned how to go beyond what I know. That's the place where I take chances. That's the place where I can make mistakes. That's the place where, you know, there's growth. And when I work with my students or my mentees or, you know, whoever I'm working with, and, you know, when they hit that space where I'm not comfortable here, I go, great, great. Let's hang on to that. And now let's start just walking through it. Not so you get comfortable, so that, but you get comfortable at being uncomfortable. And that's kind of the place where I play in nowadays is I try and live my life as not where I'm comfortable, but as in the place of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, because then I'm always learning. Um, and I guess I got, I got tidbits of that when I read through the, the, the book, Ardent Fear. Um, and then uh, I've, I've done lots of different training courses, everything from landmark education to uh, lots of different leadership courses in my time in the military. And all of those kind of culminated together with the idea of when, we're, when we do exceptional things is when we get out of the safety zone. It's when we get into the space where we have no idea what the heck we're going to do and we figure out how to move forward in that. Awesome. Well, I think that's a perfect place to stop. I want to. I wish I knew who to credit this quote with, but the quote was, "Life begins at the edge of your comfort zone," and it's something that one. And the first time I heard it, it's always stuck with me, and it, it's so true. And I think it just encapsulates what you're saying uh, very nicely. Uh, any last words before we wrap up here, John? I want to thank you for uh, having me here on your show. It's. Uh, I always love to listen to it. It. it it gives me so much information and such a great point of view that I don't often think of. So I want to just take a moment and thank you very much for uh, everything you've done and all the opportunities that you've afforded people by having these kinds of talks. So thank you. Thank you very much. And and likewise, uh, I appreciate all the people that you've mentored, even though I've never been one of your students. I'm sure that uh, I'll thank you on behalf of all those people and all the listeners. I hope that somebody contacts John. I always ask somebody to take action and send me an email uh, if you did take action, um, because I'd love to see your project come to life. And I'd love to have you on the show to help promote it once you're ready. So thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. I just want to throw out your URL here, um, www the art order just like it sounds t-h-e-a-r-t-o-r-d-e-r.com and anywhere else that we need to go to to check you out john that that would be the primary place i mean we we're also kind of on instagram facebook fun stuff like that but yeah the art order is my primary place perfect and we'll have show notes as usual at pencilkings.podcast and pencilkings.podcast what am i doing <laughs> pencilkings.com slash podcast uh, and we will see you next week with another awesome interview. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you, Mitch. Good demands patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.